Hello, nice to meet you. Where can you join the first webinar of IWA Nano and Water Specialist Group? Uh, the lecture is on um, traveling micro nanoplastic with environmental na nanotechnology. Okay, the next uh, uh, slide. Okay, uh, my name is Wang Ho, a management committee member I'm from Hunan University in China, and uh, I will preside over the online lecture instead of Professor Chen doing his busy travel. He should catch the second half hour of the talk. We uh, invite a famous Professor Mark Wisner to give an online uh, lecture, um, and uh, we 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 can have a. Uh, inter interaction in the interactive community through the Q&A discussion uh, with Professor Mark Wiesner. And uh, then uh, I will close or Professor Poulton or me. Uh, please uh, move the next slide. Okay, uh, this webinar information, this webinar will be recorded and uh, uh, made available on demand on the IWA Collects Plus platform and the IWA Data Work website with presentation slides and uh, other information. The speakers are responsible for secure, securing copyright permissions for any work that they will present or which they are not legal copyright holder. Okay, uh, let's move the next slide. Okay, we can uh, in we can have some interactive activities uh, through the chat box or Q and A box. If you have any questions, please uh, send it. Okay, let's move the next slide. Uh, okay, let me first introduce. Uh, our IWA Nano and Watt uh, Space Specialist Group. Our group mainly provides an active platform for exchanging knowledge about nanotechnology for water treatment with less whiskies and uh, uh, the environmental fate and the transport and the whiskies of nanomaterials or uh, other relevant fields. We, where can you to join our SD. Okay, next. Uh, today, we invited a former professor, Mark Wisner, to give an online lecture. Uh, Mark Wisner holds a James Duke Chair in Civil and Environmental Engineering at Duke University. He also served as a director of the NS. NSF Center for the Environmental Implications of Nanotechnologies. His work has focused on applications of emerging nanomaterials to membrane science and water treatment and a examination of the fate, transport, and effects of the nanomaterials in the environment. Wisna also is a musician Musician, and uh, he has also uh, received numerous awards and honors. Okay, uh, let's move next. Next slide. Okay, uh, please allow me to move the next next part. Let's give a warm welcome, Professor Wisner, to his lecture on. Are we wearing micro and uh, nanoplastic with uh, environmental uh, nanotechnology? Okay, pro thank you, Professor Wang Hong. Um, well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, give just a moment here to share my screen and uh, get to the right spot in the presentation here. So uh, as was indicated in the, in the introduction, the, 
the topic of the, the presentation here today is on basically what we've learned from nanotechnology. Um, and I'm having a hard time navigating to, there we go. That should be better. So it's um, looking at what we've learned from nanotechnology over uh, the last really 25 years and how that has relevance for topics that we're confronting now in the realm of micro and nanoplastics. And so what I'm going to present to you today is really, um, it's a, a condensate of uh, a tremendous amount of work that's been done by an awful lot of people. But primarily, I'm going to focus on two groups. Um, there's the Serenade Group, um, which was a, um, a, a French uh, national research uh, um, uh, funded uh, effort in Aix-en-Provence with some partners uh, um, radiating out from uh, the, uh, the Serenade Aix-en-Provence Group. And then the Center for the Environmental Applications of Nanotechnology, SAINT. Um, but I'll, I'll bring in uh, just a little bit of, um, uh, of examples from some other groups. And in, in particular, though, I just want to highlight that um, there have been, in between those two groups, between the Serenade Group and what the, the Center for Environmental Applications of Nanotechnology, or SAINT as we refer to it, uh, there's an awful lot of people involved. Uh, much of what I um, am going to present is in a, a uh, publication that uh, is under review right now with co-authors uh, Melanie Ophin uh, from the Serrej, um, Greg Lowry uh, from Carnegie Mellon, Jalicia Amos uh, from Duke, and Nathan Bosa also from Duke. And uh, there's this group in Framed, which is really sort of a continuation of uh, Saint. I'll come back to that in a moment here. But first, let's go back in time to about 1999. And um, when I sort of got myself into a bit of trouble uh, talking uh, with a French journalist from the, the newspaper Liberation, we were talking about um, uh, nanomaterials and their potential uses, of course, in the environment, but, but also um, uh, not only their applications, but their implications in terms of potential uh, impacts on, on uh, human health in the environment. And a little bit later, a couple of years later, I summarized this uh, this was published in a publication at that time called Small Times, uh, saying to summarize, you know, is with all the great things we can do with nano, is our carbon nanotubes the next best thing uh, uh, to slice bread or the next asbestos? And this was all very speculative at the time. Um, at the time, we were we were thinking whether well, there could be issues of bioconcentration, interferences with cell division, interference with with protein expression. Um, you can see the list here and. Uh, basically, over the last 25 years, much of this work uh, has um, uh, has occurred, and we've we've come to some resolution on uh, on many of these points, but still not all. In frames includes 18 universities. Oh my! All right. Well, I'm going to skip over that because there's a a, 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 a voice uh, a, animation behind it, but the, what has occurred over time is there's been really an international um, uh, community of people that have worked on this uh, this topic, and as I'd mentioned, InFrames is is one uh, such group that really brings together the people from Saint Serenade, many of our other European partners, uh, projects that existed at the time, new projects that have come in place in the meantime, and um, the uh, uh, the uh, what I'm going to, to to present to you here is really just a summary of some of the the um, uh, lessons that we've learned from this. So lesson number one is that the toxicity of um, the toxicity of small nanoparticles is uh, can largely be predicted from their composition, their redox properties, solubility and persistence. So these are things that I mean, we were looking for different nanoscale mechanisms that nanomaterials might uh, express themselves in and producing toxicity. But it really came down to much of what we already knew about the things. If you make a nanoparticle from something toxic, its composition, it will be toxic. Redox properties, if they if they react in a certain fashion, if you would predict from redox principles that there is a reaction, that there is some potential for toxicity and uh, and so on here. So. Um, as uh, as an example, here's uh, some work that Melanie Ophin uh, uh, did. Um, looking at uh, 
basically redox couples between a few nano uh, materials used to make nanomaterials and um, biological molecules. And the, this was later um, uh, verified in experiments that were done in another group uh, out at uh, UCLA, where um, the, basically if you predict that due to redox principles that there is a, um, that there is a, a potential reaction that can occur, um, then there is the possibility for it being toxic. So that we could have guessed from the outside, uh, from the outset, and uh, Melanie certainly did that, uh, played this out in, in her uh, 19, uh, 2009 uh, paper. Um, we also knew a fair amount about the toxicity of inhaled particles. Uh, so inhalation tox toxicity tells us that things that are persistent, um, things that can penetrate further down into the lungs are going to be problematic for us. And that certainly turned out to be true in nano as well. And this is an important thing to keep in mind with micro and nanoplastics, since in particular the nanoplastics, one of the, the greatest uh, sources of exposure is actually the inhalation uh, pathway, um, uh, probably over that of, um, of ingestion. A second lesson that we learned was that um, the exposure dose and, and basically the, the uptake and, and excretion behavior and materi materials at the nanoscale, it can be very different that from that in the bulk materials. So in other words, because these things are small, they can go places um, that they wouldn't be able to go otherwise. They can uh, pass through some biological membranes that can come in contact with tissues, but they have to be small enough for that to occur. And here's an example. Um, from some work, this was not, uh, this is neither a serenade or, uh, or saint work, but uh, very well makes the point, um, just focusing, for example, on, on uh, nanoscale uh, copper oxide particles with micron scale particles, or even in the case of dissolved material, uh, what one sees is that as you change the size, and this uh, continues again into, the, into the, the dissolved phase, that the dose response curves for these materials change. So size makes a difference. And the reason it makes a difference is because, um, uh, again, of the accessibility of these materials for um, various uh, tissues or various locations in an ecosystem and so on. Um, and this will be an important distinction also as we talk about the difference between microplastics and nanoplastics. Um, we can expect, again, differences in their uh, their toxicological properties. This is the way that we, the kind of the conceptual model that we laid out for how nanoparticles uh, might interact with a, um, uh, with a, let's say a bacterium if you're doing disinfection or with a tissue if it's in a, an exposure scenario. You have the transport of the particle up to uh, the near field region of, uh, let's just call it the receptor. Again, this could be a, a um, uh, a, a tissue or it could be uh, a, a microorganism. There's an attachment phase. And so how the, the relative affinity of this particle surface for the surface uh, onto which it will attach is an important factor. So we'll characterize that by the parameter alpha. Beta determines the transport. And then there's some sort of a reaction that occurs. And in the case of nanoparticles, let's say, uh, well, to take the, the copper oxide nanoparticle that we were just talking about, it might be a, a dissolution reaction uh, that occurs. And we said that the overall, um, you, can, you can look at this as, as really um, a, uh, a process involving uh, resistance uh, through uh, uh, two resistors in, in, um, uh, in series. And uh, one key part of the resistance then has to do with the attachment, this alpha uh, have the affinity of these, uh, these particles for the surfaces at, at which they're um, associating and then potentially releasing material or involving in some sort of reaction. We tested this also with um, uh, the case of uh, putting, loading up uh, carbon nanotubes with an herbicide and uh, then putting them in contact with algae and seeing how that process of the nanoparticle transport up to or the carbon nanotube transport up to the, the algae then where the algae, once it would attach, the carbon nanotube would attach the green algae, then it would release the, uh, the pesticide. That was viewed as really an application that might be um, uh, put into effect in agriculture uh, to get a, a better uh, 
um, more efficient use of, of pesticides. But you can generalize this concept here then for, you know, we've seen this in a number of different uh, scenarios like toxicity to plants and fish by nanosilver, where again, the reaction is dissolution or viral inactivation by uh, hydroxylated uh, C60 or uh, fullerenes, uh, which, which produces uh, singlet oxygen generation or uh, bacterial inactivation uh, by uh, cerium dioxide due to um, reduction uh, or again, the, the case that I just showed you of uh, uh, herbicide uh, desorption. And you can, again, describe it where the overall reaction rate is um, a function of uh, some sort of an intrinsic reaction rate. This might be the dissolution rate of the material, the attachment of uh, or the relative affinity of the particle for the surface, the uh, transport up to the surface, and then the relative concentrations of surfaces and, uh, and nanoparticles. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll return uh, to, that, to that overall um, uh, uh, framework for thinking about uh, toxicity here. But for the time being, moving on to lesson three, that a generalizable nano-based mechanism of toxicity has not been observed. So while we were expecting all sorts of different mechanisms, in fact, what we uh, learned uh, is that, or to, to date anyway, we have not really observed anything uh, uh, different about the underlying mechanism of, of toxicity, despite the fact, and I want to be very clear about this, despite the fact that there are, are large differences in the transport and potential exposure. So the, again, it, it can affect dose response curves, but that's really sort of an add me or exposure sort of issue, which is very different than the underlying uh, mechanism of, um, of toxicity. Um, if you were to rank some of the, the highest um, production nanomaterials, carbon nanotubes, nanosilver, uh, nanotitanium dioxide, in terms of their LD50, so their, their acute uh, toxicity, you can see where they sit sort of in a table here of, um, of all sorts of different things, ranging from uh, the botulism uh, uh, toxin, uh, which would be very, very toxic at very uh, low concentrations, up to sugar. Um, there are Similarly, I mean, you can look at uh, what we've learned uh, in the context of chronic effects of, um, of nanomaterials. And again, chronic effects, generally, if you, if you look, uh, stand back and look at the literature, for the most part, uh, chronic effects are observed when you have very high doses. Uh, so doses that might be greater than one would normally anticipate under um, conventional chronic um, exposure scenarios. Um, there... Um, effects that have been observed not in in actual whole organisms but they they've been in vitro systems or and or materials that are made from a known toxic material so if you make a, a nanoparticle out of something toxic then uh, it will be toxic as i was saying um, a key lesson from um, uh, from nano that needs to be considered as we move into the realm of plastics is the transformations uh, occur uh, in, in particular in complex systems where there's all sorts of different uh, elements that are interacting, uh, environmental or physiological systems. Uh, those transformations can, can change everything. And what we saw, uh, just to, to take the case of nano silver, um, uh, comparing laboratory and mesocosm data. So these are some mesocosms, more complex systems. And people have seen this in, in other um, mesocosm and field studies as well, that the, often the, what you observe in the lab is not what you observe in the field and vice versa. And the reason for that is, is usually that when, for example, you go into the lab from the field, you've forgotten to take or you couldn't take something into the lab that was present in the field. So, for example, in the case of nanosilver, uh, if you did the experiment just looking at toxicity uh, mortality to in this case it's a it's a, a larval fish um, the, if you didn't bring the algae that were out in um, in the field into your lab then you wouldn't get the impacts of the silver on the algae and the algae degradation by the bacteria and the anoxic stress that occurs uh, on the uh, uh, on the system and therefore how that that uh, translates into uh, mortality in the uh, in the fish larvae. So that's just one example, but these, these complexities and the transformations also that occur. So silver itself, when um, uh, if you're taking the original nano silver, it can be very different from uh, sulfidized 
material, which is basically oxidized silver, uh, which reduces its toxicity as well. So again, to keep in mind with plastics, which themselves can undergo all sorts of transformations in terms of fragmentation, in terms of uh, changes of, uh, of functionality on the surface of the plastics and so on. Lesson five, nanoscale materials readily interact with organisms and ecosystems. And, and so even though they're not necessarily toxic, I mean, we are swimming in nanomaterials and nanoscale materials. And it's not surprising that life has um, evolved to, uh, to use nanoscale objects and to defend itself from some, to, to some extent from nanoscale objects uh, as needed. And so the idea that when things become nanoscale, we do, we, we, we do observe bioaccumulation, we observe trophic transfer, and we've also observed intergenerational effects. So, so here's just a few uh, simple food, change, uh, food chains where we um, uh, introduced nanomaterials and they were either uh, uh, taken up and biomagnified. In some cases, this is a, a tobacco plant that's eaten by the tobacco hornworm or um, uh, the case of uh, uh, take up uh, of, of bacteria and algae into uh, uh, into uh, uh, frogs, where there's a trophic transfer, but it's actually a, um, a trophic dilution of the material. It actually, as you go up the food chain, even though it's transferred through the food chain, at each stage in the food chain, it's actually getting lower in concentration uh, as compared with biomagnification, which the classic example of that is DDT, where that can also occur in, in different, uh, uh, different cases. Uh, we've modeled this system and um, looked at the effect of um, uh, the relative affinity of a nanoparticle. So here, here's a, a simple um, uh, food chain where we have algae that are being eaten by Daphnia that are being eaten by fish. And the initial affinity of the nanoparticle for the algae it turns out that we can model this and we can do observations uh, of, of the system. It's well predicted by the, uh, the, 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 the bioaccumulation is well predicted by the attachment efficiency or the relative affinity of the nanoparticle for that surface. So we could, in this case, uh, modify um, uh, silver nanoparticles with uh, citrate or humic acid uh, uh, or an amine group. Uh, and then look at the relative concentrations that occur uh, through uh, the food chain. One of the um, original ideas with uh, a nano risk assessment was that we would be able to look at the intrinsic properties of the nanomaterials and be able to predict all the way through to risk. So we start out with nanoparticle properties we look at properties of the system. These would be things like the pH or the temperature, or UV exposure. Uh, there's also, I put over here, social properties. So they're in, in, a, in a workplace exposure sort of scenario or in a, a, a individual consumer uh, a scenario. The, the way one uses products, uh, human behavior can enter into this. So the idea was is that in taking all of these things into account, we would somehow be able to predict ultimately exposure and hazard. Uh, but of course, that's a very, very complex system. And so what we, what we introduced was this idea of a functional assay, which is an intermediate sort of um, aggregated measure of something that takes into account uh, a lot of uh, these, these sort of upstream processes and uh, allows us to make um, useful predictions of hazard and exposure. And so one of the, the important ones, uh, as you'll see, is this, this relative affinity of particles for surfaces. Um, there were all sorts of workshops that were held, and I think people continue to hold them, looking at you know, how do we predict nanoparticle uh, uh, toxicity as a function of things like their, their surface functionality, their surface charge, their aggregation, their density. Their, I mean, you can look, you just, again, uh, days have been spent, months probably of, of uh, person time has been spent um, uh, putting together these lists and looking at the, the consequences. Um, the idea of a functional assay, though, is that it groups things. And so I'm going to focus on the alpha here, this relative affinity. The beta is the physics, but the alpha is, is what it really comes down to here. Uh, 
And this determines, I mean, at, at, a, at one level, uh, the relative affinity of particles uh, for other surfaces determines, well, their aggregation rate. It determines whether or not they stick to a, um, a biological surface involved in biouptake. It determines through aggregation, uh, potentially their settling rate. It can, uh, I already showed you, affect uh, reactivity through this idea that in order for, for example, nano silver to, to have an effect on uh, on an organism, it has to go through the transport, the beta, and the attachment, the alpha, for that to occur. And all of these, in turn, are, can be described as, as functions of things like van der Waals interactions and differential settling and steric repulsion. And you can just kind of create a, you know, an additional uh, sphere here of influence that goes out to, to more and more fundamental properties like pH and temperature and shape and so on. So these functional assays really uh, collapse all of this into one quantifiable, measurable, measurable um, uh, um, uh, parameter that we can use then to make predictions of exposure and um, uh, exposure and toxicity. And I don't want to suggest that alpha is the only one. Far from it. I mean, there are there are things like dissolution rate, for example, or transformation rates that are quite important. But this is this is one that, as I showed you earlier, it gives us some predictability in terms of uh, trophic transfer and, and so forth. And we we were able to demonstrate in uh, again mesocosm studies that uh, we had a, a great deal of predictive capability with alpha to say where the material just where it would actually go. Uh, in uh, various compartments uh, of our uh, environmental compartments of our ecosystem. So there you have sort of a background on lesson, lessons learned. I, there's a couple more that I'm going to bring up here, but I just want to point out at this point that when you think about uh, micro nanoplastics, I mean, there's, it's, it's much of the, the same sorts of uh, uh, concepts come into play. And so this is an image from a, a project that's, uh, that's ongoing that we have with Suffolk uh, right now that uh, uh, with uh, the UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology and BSF, uh, University of Amsterdam. And there are a few um, affiliated projects uh, looking, at, um, looking at various elements of this, uh, this problem as well. But you can see there's, there's things like aggregation and, and, and settling and bio, it says biofouling, but there's you know, bio interactions and uh, uh, transport into sediments, uh, additive release. Okay, so many, one of the important things in, in, uh, in micro and nanoplastics, uh, independent of what one might learn about potential toxicity of a plastic is that there are additives in plastics that we know uh, to be toxic, like uh, PFAS, like uh, uh, BPA and, and others. So um, these, this concept of, of having particles in a nano scale range that interact with biological surfaces and then release uh, the material, uh, that framework that I showed you earlier is certainly uh, germane to, um, uh, to, to this problem as well. Um, the, this, this is from uh, uh, the paper that we did, uh, some, some colleagues uh, at the um, uh, University of Rennes and, um, and Duke, and then also uh, at Montreal, Natalia Tuzhensky. We, we looked at the, the effect of um, particle size on release of additives from plastics. So we're using a model here for basically uh, diffusive leaching from a sphere. And as that sphere gets smaller, the time that it takes to have half of the uh, additive released becomes smaller and smaller. And so very small particles, not surprisingly with all the surface area that they present, they can release additives very quickly. And it's the larger particles that um, will actually retain the additive for longer periods of time. And out in environments where there's wave action or um, um, uh, wear due to, um, you know, tire wear or any other, you know, chewing in a, in a human exposure uh, scenario. Uh, as, as materials get smaller, we expect that the, the release, therefore, of the additives is going, to, is going to increase. Now, there has been some work done in the, um, the microplastic community where they've suggested that microplastics, some of this biggest, bigger stuff, can get into tissues, 
of fish. I'm skeptical of those results because of what we know from nano, where you basically have to get down in the 10 to 30 nanometer range before things become really super um, uh, uh, available to uh, internal organs. So the translocation uh, in um, uh, not only in animals, but in plants as well. But this, this uh, the figure here just sort of summarizes that um, uh, interaction between the fragmentation process uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the bio uh, or the, the release for potential bio exposure to of additives. Basically, as the as I said, if you just conceptually look, make particle size get bigger and think about its bioavailability. Again, the bigger particles should be less bioavailable, um, and uh, you saw that again with the, uh, the the nano copper example I showed you early on, where the micro uh, uh, copper oxide was. Um, was less toxic, had a, a dose response curve that showed less toxicity at a given dose than the nanoparticle um, variety of that. So bioavailability, that's consistent with the idea that bioavailability is decreasing as the particle size gets bigger. But as I said, the, the release of the additives, if, they're, if it's the additives that are of interest, the release of additives is increasing uh, as we uh, get to the, uh, the smaller and smaller sizes and decreasing as we get to the, the bigger sizes. And so if you think about the potential uh, for, um, for additive exposure, if you will, you can kind of think of it as there's a potential sweet spot where it's, it's small enough uh, to have more bioavailability and big enough that um, the, uh, the leaching doesn't happen super fast. It'll stay in the particle long enough to actually um, uh, remain as it moves through, say, a digestive tract and then is taken up into the tissues of the organism. All right, so back to various lessons. Uh, exposure to natural and incidental uh, nanoscale particles is many orders of magnitude greater than the engineered materials. And um, the point being here that, as I said earlier, we're, we're swimming in nanomaterials. We have uh, nanomaterials that um, uh, naturally occur from wearing processes, uh, we have nanomaterials that uh, come off of a uh, forest fire. Um, uh, and sometimes these are exactly the same nanomaterials. I mean, a lot of the fullerene materials that one finds in, um, in combustion products from uh, coming out of a, a, a tailpipe or a smokestack or a, a forest fire or a factory where you're making a carbon C, uh, uh, C60, um, there it's your, the C60 is the C60. It's the same in all of those processes. And it's the natural and the incidental, so natural being the forest fires, let's say, and the incidental being the, the smokestack, that uh, are really going to be much more dominant in terms of potential exposure than the engineered materials. And that's where the, the nanoplastics come in. These are incidental, potentially incidental nanomaterials. We can also manufacture micro and nanoplastics, and there are products that use those. But for the most part, most of the, I mean, the, the, one of the largest um, sources of, uh, of micro and nanoplastics is tire wear. And so that's clearly an incidental uh, uh, material. And it's, it's just orders of magnitude greater when you look at the, the, the amounts produced from natural and, and incidental sources compared with the engineered sources of nanomaterials. Um, the last lesson I'll put out here is has to do with data platforms. So uh, as we generated data and um, and wanted to compare uh, data across studies and share data between researchers and so on, um, it became apparent that we needed a specific architecture in order to, to, to store the data uh, uh, to make that possible. And what we arrived at is this notion of instance mapping, which takes uh, uh, characterization of you know, intrinsic properties, the nanomaterials, uh, characterization of the systems that those nanomaterials fall in. Here again, you see the social and engineered properties. It can take information on functional assays like surface affinity and dissolution rate and, and uh, in, in vitro uh, bioassays. And it can put all of this together. And so an instance map basically is just a map of how uh, materials change over time. So an instance is defined by a place and a time. And um, so you might take, for example, nano silver powder of a given size, and uh, this is your initial material. 
you suspend it in water and now it's in a new spot, it's in water. And so the water has a pH and it might have a dissolved organic carbon associated with that. And you can think of other, other descriptors of this water medium here. And the, the nano silver suspension itself can change. Okay, so uh, it, it can be oxidized in the water. Uh, there are new properties that emerge uh, as, uh, as, as when we put the nanomaterial in water. Now, all of a sudden we have an interface with the water and there's a, there's a, a, a surface potential that will approximate with the zeta potential that characterizes that and so on. This, this material once in water, it might be taken up by plants. And now we can, we can talk about all of the, the plant medium uh, and even subdivide that into various tissues of the plant, be it the, 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 the roots or the, the, the leaves, uh, et cetera. And again, monitoring how the nanomaterial itself changes as it moves from one basically compartment, one space in time to another. Um, so this has all been um, uh, the, the, the notion of instance mapping. We put that uh, forward in the, the nanoinformatics knowledge commons, the NIC. And uh, it's been um, uh, this, this, this architecture of instance mapping has been uh, uh, adopted by a number of, uh, of different groups, uh, not only in Serenade and uh, ISANE, which is a, a precursor to Serenade, but in some various uh, European EU projects have, have used this and, and others. So that concludes my story. Um, basically, in terms of concluding remarks, I mean, I hopefully have given you a sense of if I haven't even mentioned it specifically, you can see the possibility for how the 25 years of, of uh, work that uh, has been done in nano uh, EHS or environmental health and safety research uh, has yielded models and protocols uh, for uh, uh, looking uh, at that, that can be used to, to study micro and nanoplastics. Um, keeping in mind that particle toxicity is uh, our experience is primarily predictable based on composition. And then, as we said, uh, the, the, the experience that's been garnered from uh, inhalation toxi toxicology. Um, we have uh, to date no uniquely nano mechanisms uh, for toxicity. But again, remember that the nano aspects of materials, including nanoplastics, are likely to play a role in terms of where things can go and therefore what the dose response curves for those materials will be. And that these, these uh, examples such as nanoplastics of, of an incidental and also there are naturally occurring uh, uh, particles as well, they, uh, they are likely to be um, much more important uh, uh, vectors of, uh, of risk than um, many of the uh, engineered nanomaterials that have been produced today. So with that, I'll stop sharing and open things up for questions here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor, Ed, uh, for wonderful presentation. Uh, I know there are two questions about your presentations. Okay. Uh, the first one is from Keyword. He is he has the questions about his he his questions is there is any simple a uh, biomark are uh, available or not, which strain the particular nanoplastic in liberation la vie, with not? Yeah, so um, hmm. I'm not sure that I entirely understand the question. So the so nanoplastics, um, I mean, there are, we often can use additives that are in nanoplastics as um, markers for the plastics themselves. I, I think what this question is, is probably going the heart of it is a, is a very important issue, which is how does one differentiate uh, a basically a carbon material with all the background carbon that might be present in in a, 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 an environmental setting or a physiological setting, uh, and um, and the answer is is that with nanoplastics um, you, you, there might be additives like metals that one could trace. Um, we've used. Uh, 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 PFAS could be another possible tracer. Sometimes there are uh, colorants that are added to um, to plastic. So these are all uh, things that, um, again, one needs to be careful about when when the additive is still in the plastic and when it's it's come out into the solution. First, uh, 
go-to um, response in terms of uh, how one might trace these materials in a, uh, a system like a zebrafish larva. Okay, maybe the maybe the answer is suitable for our attendees. <laughs> uh, okay, let's move the second uh, uh, the sixth questions. And his question is: Is there there is any cancer case in human history that mainly caused by nanoplastics or the accumulations of the nanoplastic or the human body is able to get rid of it by digestion systems? So um, I think most of the data that's been produced, I mean, so it's, it's very difficult to, to put all plastics in one compartment. And so it sort of depends on the plastic. So there are the polystyrene, for example, we know that styrene on its own, uh, the, the, the monomer, that is, that is of concern from a, uh, a health standpoint. Uh, there are um, fluorinated versions of plastics that I think by um, um, extrapolation from what we know of other fluorinated products, that would be of concern. But my primary concern, uh, either not necessarily well, it could be cancer, possibly, but um, um, also uh, modifications in, uh, you know, endocrine disruptors and so on. Uh, that's, it's the additives. I, I think the additives, we already know that there are bad things that are added to plastics uh, to and maybe prevent their degradation due to UV, to make them uh, resistant to fire. Um, so uh, those sorts of materials uh, have known uh, toxic properties and uh, and are associated with the, the 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 exposure to and the use of the plastics. Okay. Uh, the third question is uh, oh, yeah, it's uh, Su Yun Kim from South Korea. His question is uh, about the Cephic uh, LRI, LRI programs. And he is very interested uh, that your work has expanded beyond lab scale in investigate the real life instance would the location matter uh, give the degree of pollution and so on dif differs across countries and uh, therefore location and did this affect your research or mechanism of nano Macro nano micro plastic transfer effect on hers or and so on. Yes. Yeah. Well, the short answer is yes. It uh, the location matters. Um, at the end, then, when I was talking about instance mapping, I was showing that an instance um, going into an instance is not only the property of the nanomaterial, let's say a nanoplastic, but also the property of the medium that it's found in, and so. You know, I highlighted things like pH and dissolved organic carbon, but also things like the um, the power input. So, you know, what's the the what's the role of wave action? Uh, how does how does uh, hydrodynamic scour um, uh, affect things differentially in a uh, uh, near a beach, for example, on the ocean, or in, compared with a river? Um, so all of those things will matter. UV exposure. I mean, whether you're in the, the, the top of a lake or the bottom of the lake, um, whether you're in deep ocean or, you know, beach areas, uh, all of those things will matter. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, um, the recycling of plastic can cause the release of uh, microplastic and the nanoplastic. So is it better to stop the recycling? We're trying to answer that question right now. So we, an ongoing, actually CEFIC funded project um, that is uh, uh, building on uh, the work of Bernd Novak in Switzerland and also with the UK uh, Center for uh, Ecology and Hydrology um, we're looking at the flow. It's a mass uh, flow uh, model for you know where the plastics are generated, how they're used, which compartments they end up in. 
And one of the one of the the scenarios that we're considering is during recycling. Uh, so when you recycle plastics, there's wash water that comes into play, and there's plastics that come off of that. There are uh, major recycling players like Suez Environment and Veolia that are um, uh, that are actually undergoing their own studies uh, to look at um, what the presence of uh, uh, micro and nanoplastics might be. Uh, in in some of the, the waters that, that come off of uh, off of those recycling operations. There's, of course, also the potential for worker exposure and inhalation that one needs to be concerned about. So, yeah, I, I certainly agree. It's uh, it's a very potentially an important um, a source of plastic. Now, is it better to uh, stop recycling? Um, I think a more fundamental question is um, that of uh, what's the role of recycling in plastics in general? Uh, is that a real uh, activity or is it an activity uh, that um, uh, is a minority of, of uh, really the plastics overall that are being used? I mean, I, I think the number in the United States for the, the amount of plastics that are actually recycled is somewhere around 10%. So. Okay, thank you your answers. And there are two attendees have the uh, the, the, the seminar answers. Then the 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 question the question is uh, that there are two have similar uh, questions. The question is uh, how would the awareness of meal uh, plastic may might change the water industry and uh, what are the Consider the technologies for the remove of nanoplastics, and uh, uh, are there any uh, technologies uh, under development for future for us? Yeah, so I mean, it, it's it's a particle, and um, it, these are not the first nanoparticles that we've had to deal with in water treatment. We've been removing viruses for quite some time, although we often depend on viral inactivation. So, um, but we, you know, in, in principle, you know, even a depth filter is quite efficient at removing small Brownian type particles. Uh, membranes, micro ultrafiltration certainly can play a role in removing particles uh, such as uh, nanoplastics. Uh, the actual amounts of these materials, again, this is an active field of study uh, where people are going through treatment plants and trying to verify that these processes remove what we think they're removing. And um, uh, those are uh, those, those sort of, you know, following the train of treatment that uh, uh, some of that work has been published and, and uh, more studies are ongoing. Okay. Uh, because the, 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 the time is close to 11, uh, 11. So we have the last uh, questions. Uh, we choose the uh, chat box. Yes, uh, based your based on your pre presentation, the bottom the bottom water industry is is it mostly damaging the human health since those bottoms bottoms can things nanoplastic. How to um how to how to reduce the impact? Um. Yeah. Well, that's that's a great question. Uh, stop using plastic, uh, but there's really not a, a, a viable alternative for uh, uh, unless you go to all glass bottles, uh, which have their own issues. So, from a you know a, a CO two footprint uh, scenario, um, I think we're only understanding uh, right now. I mean, there's there's recently been in the news uh, 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 reports of. Uh, uh, some of the uh, mineral waters, uh, the high-end sort of boutique mineral waters that have, uh, people have found nanoplastics and other contaminants in, in them as well. And um, so, I, yeah, I think from a plastic standpoint, um, the key is making plastics that, um, uh, that have a lower um, potential for shedding material that have uh, remove the potential for the leaching of additives, that, that would be my primary concern. Okay, can you explain the toxicity of the 
uh, nanoparticle. So the toxicity of the nanoparticle, again, nanoparticles are toxic when we make them out of something toxic. Nanoparticles are toxic if they're inhaled and they're persistent in the lungs. Um, nanoparticles can be toxic if they're carrying something toxic, as in the case of some of the additives that we mentioned. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wisner. Uh, um, our web... Okay. Our webinar is uh, the time is close to uh, 11 p.m. So uh, our discussing uh, is end. Uh, okay, Professor Wisner. Okay. Well, thank you to everyone to uh, for having participated in this and. Uh... Okay, uh, let's move to the next part. Okay, the upcoming IWA web web webinars and events is, uh, uh, the first is uh, managing this uh, infection and the byproduct for uh, safe water. Uh, it will be held in uh, April 24, 24 and 2024. Uh, it will be held in China, Shenzhen University. The second, uh, uh, the, 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 the second one is uh, uh, collecting younger water professional in Asia and the Pacific. Pacific. And the third is uh, a webinar with the water surveillance in now serene uh, settings. Uh, it will be held in May uh, 16, 2024. Okay, let's move to the next slide. Uh, uh, if, you, if you have more some information, we can link the website about the, the, the 19th IWA leading aging conference on water and the wastewater technologies. The extended deadline is June uh, 3. Uh, we welcome uh, you to attend the, 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 the World Water Congress and the exhibitions. Exhibition. It will be held in Toronto, Toronto at uh, uh, 11, 11 and 15 August 20. 24. Okay, let, let's move the next slide. And if you want to join our network of the water uh, professionals, uh, IWA brings professionals from many disciplines together to accelerate the science, innovation, and the practice that can make a difference in addressing water challengers. You can use code, you can use this code for 20% uh, discount of new membership. A drawing before 31 December 2024 at uh, this website. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Visna, for the great presentation. And uh, thank you all attendees and uh, thank you for all of us.